Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Good morning to everyone. So um, before we start the event, I would like to first and foremost acknowledge that here at Simon Fraser University, we eat, we live, we play, we work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I'd like to pause for a second because it's very, very important not to just take land acknowledgement as something that you just say. At this event, particularly as a planner and in a planning event, it's so important to consider that a land acknowledgement is actually a commitment to action, a commitment and a responsibility. Because as a planner, we work for the public good. The public interest and the public good. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome students. Um, so anyway, if you have not had the opportunity, I would like to bring your attention to a document that we produce here at SFU. Walk, with, walk this path with us. And if you have not had the opportunity to check it out, I would like for you to do that because it actually outlines our commitment to reconciliation. Okay, so jot that down. That would be awesome. Okay, so we're basically ready to start. Um, who here is interested in a career in planning? I wonder. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> of course. Uh, perfect, perfect. So if you don't know my name, if you don't know me, I'm still a stranger. My name is Tamara Soma. I'm a prof here at SFU with the School of Resource and Environmental Management. And I have the best job in the world because I get to teach planning. So today is actually a very special day because usually we have a course, um, it's called Introduction to Planning, Plan 200, where we have 20 very bright, smart students. I know I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you. Um, but today we have a special guest of more than just the 20 students, including groups of high schools that are actually watching this on webcast. Hello, webcast folks, hello, uh, welcome. So anyway, um, today is a very special day. We have five very wonderful human beings um, who basically their, whole, their life, their passion, their profession is to serve the community and is also um, literally to make the world a better place. The first person that I'm going to introduce is our dean, the dean of the Faculty of Environment, Dr. Naomi Krogman. Dr. Naomi Krogman is an environmental sociologist and she came here to SFU from the University of Alberta where she's done a lot of different amazing things around sustainability and environmental, um, environmental justice. So she is going to be hosting and moderating the panel today. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Naomi Krogman to the seat. Great. Thank you. Oh, yes, feel free. Okay, now I can tell you can hear me. Hello again. Okay, so again, thank you all for joining us today to understand what planning is and how it affects different aspects of our lives. Um, I'd like to give a special welcome to the high school classes who are joining us remotely, and that would be from the environmental studies class from New Westminster Secondary and an IV geography class from Carson Graham Secondary in North Vancouver. So many of you know environmental issues are probably the most pressing issues of our time. And planners in particular are at the center of it. They are the ones that are actually bringing together all of the knowledge and it really is so interdisciplinary. It involves um, environmental uh, conditions, it involves engineering, sociology, it involves economic development, um, it involves protected areas and conservation. It is such an integrated position to be in and there are many jobs in it. Um, the graduates in planning programs tend to be 
imminently employable in these times. So the Faculty of Environment recognizes this and is pleased to share um, that you will be invited to apply to the 2020 Resource and Environmental Management Planning Stream in the undergraduate program offerings. Um, and we are in a position that these students will be prepared to be certified as planners. And it also prepares you should you want to go on for graduate studies in planning because we also have a master's program and the emphasis in the planning program is on environmental planning um, but i do want to mention that we also have um, an emphasis on urban studies in the geography program um, and many of those courses teach us about how cities change and thrive how the rules or the policies of a city can affect quality of life um, and looking at other issues such as uh, livability, sustainability, economic development, and so on. So the format for this morning is that I will invite each planner up to the podium to share a few experiences, and then I will invite all of them, after every person has had a chance to speak, to answer some questions from either me or the audience, preferably from the audience. Um, our first planner, is Ada Chan Russell, who is a social planner with the city of Vancouver. Ada works in the area of community and childcare infrastructure, agriculture and development. Please join me in welcoming Ada to the podium. We decided that we're just gonna sit here. So this is me on my podium, but um, I'm Ada. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got into planning. And I think it relates to a lot of um, people who are in high school or starting your under undergrad. Like for me, um, I came from a family where, I mean, I had my parents support me. And when I graduated high school, I didn't really know where I wanted to go. So I went to my dad, my dad, who is an um, immigrant family, um, and asking him, like, what, you know, what do you think I should do? And his answer was, just do whatever you want. So that was not very helpful for me at the time and I'm like okay um, I, I had no idea I started doing general arts and kind of kind of exploring around kind of what I wanted to do wasn't quite sure and actually ended up um, in the communications department at SFU so I did my undergrad here applied science building was the core building I know I had classes all over so this is kind of where I, I ended up and when I came out I was doing some communications work actually um, for nonprofits and community organizations I think at, in my heart I kind of wanted to do things that were for the community at that time already but when I was doing it I was the more communications I did um, while working with the community I felt like I wanted to do more I was telling people I'm like you know I want to work with the community help them make changes and maybe talk to more people and people were saying you should go into planning and I had no idea what planning was I never heard of it um, what what do planners do um, so I started looking into it um, after a while I was applying for different schools I ended up at um, U of T, so I moved to um, Ontario to do my work there and, and was exposed to a lot of like social classes, um, land use classes, and after I graduated, um, it was hard for me to look for work. I ended up actually um, deciding to move out of province. I'm like, let's try something different. Um, I moved to Regina and uh, I worked for the city of Regina. It was a very uh, bitter winters there, so um, very hard for a West Coaster. But when I was there, I was doing a lot of um, uh, development planning, a lot of land use, so um, I was using the zoning bylaw a lot. So that's very traditional type of planning, which was not, I don't think it really was what I wanted to do, but it gave a really good foundation for, for planning work. Um, and later, after a few years, I wanted to move back to BC. So I, when I came back, I found work um, as a policy planner at the city of Richmond. And there I was the agricultural planner. So I was learning a lot of provincial legislation, um, municipal legislation about ALR. Um, one of the highlights there was um, for us to uh, limit the house sizes on farmland at that time was very controversial before um, it was provincially legislated um, to be at a certain time. So they capped the 
province capped it for everyone. But before then, we had to go out, and it was very controversial, and lots of stakeholders. Um, and then after that, it was a because it was a kind of a temporary position. I found work um, at the city where I am today. I am a social planner, and so. What we, our focus is, is looking at um, social infrastructure. So this is spaces for social types of uses. So we have, an, under our portfolio, we do a lot of childcare. Um, we do things such as um, nonprofit office spaces, senior centers, uh, places where people gather, including youth centers. So we do policy to kind of um, grow these types of things. At the city, we have a lot of, um, through development, um, have, um, contributions from developers to build such facilities. So we work with them on those types of projects, um, incentivizing those types of uses, as well as look at policy to retain those that are going um, through redevelopment. So it's been really interesting so far. I think it's a good way to marry the land use um, background that I have, as well as my interest in community and supporting social types of um, community members and groups. Thank you, Ada. Wow, what? you've done so many things for such a young career person. But it just really shows the versatility. That's amazing. OK. Um, next, we have uh, Rebecca Mahaffey, who is a social planner with the city of Burnaby, working in the area of inclusion, access, neighborhood, and food security. Hello. Great. OK. So I'm also going to share a little bit of my story about how I came to planning, because I think I'm an illustration that pretty much with any undergrad degree, you can become a planner with a little bit of focus. So I did my undergraduate education in art history. So if you want to know about 1600s paintings, I'm your gal. Um, and then after that, I um, did some additional courses in community development and international development. I went overseas to work for a couple of years in Sri Lanka, came back, worked in non the nonprofit world with um, immigrant serving organizations. And at a certain point, I realized that I wanted to get a little bit more political, but not become a politician. <laughs> so the other part of my, my youth was um, a lot of protests, a lot of um, sort of grassroots political action, and I wanted to try to find a way to bring that back into my, my life. And so that's how I found planning. Um, planning for me has become a way for me to get close to decision making and to have input into decision making while not being a politician. Maybe someday, it's just not for me right now, because it's really hard work to be under the spotlight all the time. Politicians do lots of unfortunate things and things they shouldn't because, anyways, no comment. <laughs> You'll have seen the news. Um, but it's really hard work and not for me right now, but planning allows me to get close to that. Um, so I just sort of did a shot in the dark. I applied to a bunch of planning schools. I was living in Alberta with my family at the time. I got into the School of Community and Regional Planning at UBC, moved out here, and the rest is history. When I first graduated, I um, worked for nonprofits for another sort of year and a half. It is hard getting that first job. And then I was able to find, uh, I got a contract with the province, with the then Ministry of Housing and Social Development. And in that role, I was sort of like a planner for hire. I went around to small municipalities all over BC to assist with um, access for persons with disabilities. This was leading up to the Olympics and there was some provincial funding to try to spread the benefits around the province. That ended with the economic downturn, and then I was, able, again, lucky to find work at the city of Burnaby, where I've been for almost 10 years. I've blinked, and time has flown. I'm also a social planner. It's nice to see social planning so well represented. It's sort of the, the part of planning that you don't get to hear about as much and talk about as much. And we're really lucky in British Columbia, in particular, to have, relatively speaking, a lot of social planning positions. That's not the case in all parts of Canada. So at the city of Burnaby, there are three social planners. Um, how many are in Vancouver? Do you know? Um, I think about 30. Yeah, so in Vancouver, I mean, it's a bigger place, uh, more complexity, but there's more um, opportunity to specialize in Vancouver. Um, in Burnaby, we're 
we are forced to be generalists. So we have really broad portfolio areas that if you don't know really anything about, you just have to fake it until you make it. Do some research, talk to the community members, and figure it out. So just to give a sense of the, the breadth, um, my current portfolios are, so access and inclusion, which is, you know, everything. Um, <laughs> so specifically, I focus on uh, issues for persons with disabilities, not just physical disabilities, but a broad range. Um, LGBTQIA2S plus inclusion. So it's a big deal for Burnaby. We had our second Pride event this past summer. Um, when you're sandwiched right next to Vancouver, often people go to Vancouver for services and those kinds of events, but Burnaby is growing. And so now there's a need for more local uh, infrastructure. And so we're really working hard on that at the moment. Um, civic engagement, uh, I also work on a lot. So getting people to be aware of their local government and, and to take up the opportunities to participate in it. And then also making the opportunities to the best of my ability by working with my coworkers um, accessible in the sense that you can find out where they are, they meet with your time frame, child care, different languages available, all that kind of good stuff. I also work in the area of diversity and interculturalism and interfaith. Um, so there's a community committee for everything in Burnaby. Um, I have to give full cred to the Burnaby community because they are an involved bunch. And so through my role in all of these portfolios, I sit on a lot of community tables. About 65% of my time, maybe 70, is outside of the office going to community meetings and talking to people. And particularly in the interculturalism and interfaith issues, um, I'm out a lot. I also work on food security and food systems. This isn't as well developed in Burnaby as in Vancouver, but we're, we're trying. Um, I'm the city's liaison for the Union of BC Municipalities and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, and then a growing area of my work is um, around truth and reconciliation. And so I thought that was really uh, lovely. Thank you for uh, providing us a moment to reflect on that at the beginning of our time today. We um, just recently, Burnaby City Council uh, recognized the unceded territory. This is a big deal. Um, and it's been really refreshing in this last iteration of council since the most recent election. Things have really started to, to grow. And so it's been a great honor to work on that. And then finally, I also work on the social infrastructure and not to the same level of detail because there just aren't enough hours in the day. Um, but social planning um, sits on development review panels, and so we help negotiate the density bonus elements that go for social infrastructure. So nonprofit housing spaces, childcare, hospice recently, you know, those kinds of things. And also we get cash contributions, which are pooled for new community centers, for example. And then I won't belabor my, my time here, but I wanted to just give you a sense of what my, my coworkers work on. Because there's three of us, we're a pretty tight bunch and we have to just trade things back and forth and go to each other's meetings if people are on vacation or something. But the other areas within social planning are managing the, all the leases for the city-owned spaces, so childcare, the nonprofit leases, all that kind of thing, at community gardens. Um, homelessness, so as you may know, in Burnaby, the previous council was very clear that housing and homelessness was not the responsibility of local government. Um, this new council has taken a different perspective, and so we opened warming centers in five weeks, which just about, it was wonderful, but <laughs> almost put the staff, <laughs> we needed to, you know, go for a rest cure after that. And um, we just opened up the first homeless shelter in Burnaby about a month ago. Um, we also work on youth issues and uh, sex work, childcare, of course, um, community schools. So in Van Burnaby, and I assume in Vancouver as well, um, certain schools around the city are co-funded, like by the school board, and then also by the city so that they can act as de facto community centers. And so we manage those relationships and that funding. Um, and then seniors. So it's a lot, uh, but it's also really great because when there are moments when a certain topic politically just isn't going anywhere, you can move to one that does have momentum. And that's been really, really great. 
And I love working out in the community so much. For me, with my background, that's really kept me going. If I had to sit at a desk all the time, that would be hard for me. And generally in planning, even if you're a development planner, I think there is a lot of opportunity for that kind of community work, um, both offered to you and for what you make in the role. And so I think that's a real bonus if that's your personality in the planning profession. So I've babbled enough, I'll pass it on. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Really makes me feel lucky to live in Burnaby to know that you're, you and your team are working on all those things. It's amazing. So next we have Nadia Carvalho. She's a project coordinator with Vancouver Immigration Partnership, working in the area of land use, multiculturalism, and economic development. Please join me in welcoming Nadia. Thank you. So yeah, I am starting with the immigrant family story. My dad had his, my career all chosen for me, just like his dad had his career chosen for him. Um, it's always great when what your parents want you to do align with what you want to do was not the case here. Uh, he had business, accounting, I'm like, do you not know me? I'm not, you know, that linear thinker that you'd like me to be. But um, so, you know, I went that route, um, but my heart really wasn't in it. Uh, where my heart was, I remember being in grade eight, walking into grade nine classroom at a tour of the high school and walking into drafting class. And I was kind of intrigued, you know, um, but I put that away because my dad directed me somewhere else. And, um, and, uh, just always kept that interest in the back of my head, but always thought you had to be an architect to be involved in building cities. Um, and it wasn't until I was in university and met some classmates from high school who were in urban planning, who I, you know, I knew weren't really the architect types, and they said there was this whole policy side to planning and city building, and, and so I immediately went and uh, figured out what programs had that were suitable for me, um, and made the switch, and ended up doing a double major in um, basically sociology and urban studies before doing my master's at UBC in planning. Um, part of my double major was in immigrant communities, ethnic and kind of race relations, um, and the other part was, you know, looking at cities. And so it's really interesting because I've always tried to um, make city planning processes more inclusive. So if we're going out and we're doing a 20, 30 year plan for a neighborhood, how are we including everybody in the neighborhood in the, the decisions that, you know, have significant Im economic impact on their lives. Um, and so that's kind of always been kind of a, a theme to my work. Um, I experienced a lot of racism <laughs> growing up. Uh, anyway, so that has always been a passion of mine. Sorry, I can never talk about it. <laughs> Getting upset, so we'll see how I do. Um, but uh, I'm very fortunate to be here at the city right now because I'm also working on uh, the equity framework for the city. Uh, I think I'll park that because I'm not sure I'm getting upset. So, um, so back to my career tra trajectory. Um, yeah, so I did my undergrad. And at the time, I remember being an undergrad going, you know, I kind of want to go to college at the same time. And I want to learn drafting and I want to learn these hard skills. But there was no program that let me do that in the summers, kind of like the Langara program that they have now, because I didn't need to be in architecture school. But I knew I needed a few more hard skills. So that opportunity didn't exist now and it does exist, uh, sorry, it didn't exist then, but it does exist now. Um, but anyway, so I did the double major and then I came to UBC. Um, because I was very intrigued by Vancouver and I um, at the time um, you know growing up in Toronto the Toronto area wanted uh, to live in a different community and have a different kind of lifestyle that Toronto had to offer um, and after graduating from planning school um, I ended up getting an internship at the city of Richmond so there's lots of connections here and it was interesting because a lot of the diversity work had been done before I got there. So the manager of the department was Filipino, foreign trained. Um, you know, there was a, in, a, a Chinese planner who had grown up in India, in Calcutta. That's where the, there was a Chinese community there. There was another Chinese planner who was from Hong Kong. Uh, my white colleague had done Asian studies as an undergrad, right? Our city manager was black. And I was like, okay, this is, this is the way it is kind of in Toronto. And this is the way it is in Vancouver. And it made sense to me. And that was, uh, how many years ago? 25 years ago. So I just thought that was the way the world was, right? But my friend told me, oh, the hard work had been done before you got here to get to that point. 
Um, so it was a community that was very much ready for the changing population. Um, and so working in that community, I also realized that there weren't a lot of jobs for social planners. So because cities um, see that as a downloading from other levels of government. So outside Vancouver, where they're kind of on the front line of various social issues, they're very kind of reticent to step in and take on a lot of social planning issues. And that's just my perspective and my opinion and what I've kind of witnessed. Um, and so I always knew how do I be, be the most employable and be flexible um, because if there are not a lot of jobs out there and the market can be very tight at times, I wanted to make sure I had the most versatility. So I set, you know, I started doing um, census analysis and data analysis and I took tasks that were maybe went against my grain so I could really stretch myself and develop my skills. I worked on industrial strategies. I worked on economic development strategies. Again, I had those interests, but I, I wanted to make sure um, my portfolio, my skill set was broad, but that I was also contributing something different by being able to bring that social perspective and that diversity and inclusion perspective to all of the work I did. Um, after working in Richmond, I then spent most of my career at the city of Coquitlam, where I worked on, you know, neighborhood plans and um, I worked on a multicultural strategy and again, economic development strategy. Um, so again, you can see the kind of variety of which those critical skills get you. Um, and then before coming to Vancouver, where I work in social policy, finally, um, and I work as a, a social planner um, on a federally funded project uh, where there's 80 of these partnerships that run across the country. Uh, we have 80 organizations and 125 partners that we work with on a collaborative table that works on making the city more welcoming and inclusive for newcomers. So that's working on economic policy, so you see the connection, right? Um, working on inclusive engagement, again, back to what I've been doing all along, and then access to services. Um, through that work there, uh, emerging as a city priority became uh, the need for an internal facing equity strategy. So as we were out in the community, the community came to us. It was actually the Poverty Action um, at Community Advisory Committee that says, before you come to the community talking about equity and inclusion, you need to get your house in order. And that's what they told us. And what that means is that the policies that we write are influenced by our internal processes. And if our internal processes aren't aligned to be equitable, then the end result will not be equitable and inclusive. And so that led to, it's leading to a lot of hard conversations internally. We talk about um, racism, we talk about white privilege, we talk about why as a city, when our populations were at 45% visible minority in 1995, a quarter of a century ago before cell phones, um, that we don't have that same representation within the city of Vancouver staff complement, right? So those are challenging conversations to have because a lot of people see the diversity on our buses and our restaurants and our schools, and they believe in the brand of diversity, but we haven't done the work to get to fulfill the vision of diversity. And so what equity is doing is it conversations about racial equity, is, which is an element that we're foregrounding this work with, changes the underlying power dynamic from diversity and inclusion, which centers all of us who are settlers on this land, and saying, you know, we're so, we're, we're so kind, we're, we're so great as Canadians, we're here letting everybody else in, to the system was built on um, a system that privileges some groups over others. And so it does require a lot of challenge, it requires a lot of courage, it requires te <laughs> tears and <laughs> that. Um, and so, but we're getting there. And then, um, and we're just at the beginning phases of that work, but it's transformative work. And I feel so grateful to be there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I think, Nadia, what's so striking to me listening to you is, um, you know, most of my career I've been employed at universities, but universities now are very interested in EDI, equity, diversity, inclusivity. But Nadia and planners know, what does that really mean materially to create conditions for greater equity, inclusivity, and diversity? Um, how is it embedded into our laws? How is it embedded into spaces that um, entice certain kinds of interactions to occur and certain kinds of negative interactions to occur? So, I mean, it's, it's very inspiring to listen to you because you actually understand 
How can you really move ahead on those things rather than just say we all should be nicer to each other? Um, so our next person is Deer. And um, Deer Bokanan is a policy planner with the Downtown Eastside Neighborhoods Group working in urban design and sustainability. Thanks, Deer. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me, having us, and hello to the high school students. Um, I uh, am so thrilled to be here and to hear more about my colleagues and, and others in the industry. Um, my journey into planning, uh, I guess, started um, at some point in my undergrad. I also didn't realize planning was a profession, was a thing. Um, and I, I am an immigrant, I'm not Canadian, so I came to Canada to do my undergraduate studies in environmental science. So I, you know, I was passionate about um, the environment and I had the privilege of growing up in many different cities um, throughout my childhood because of my dad's job and it took us um, to a couple different postings where, you know, so I followed him for a while. So I was, my hometown is um, Bangkok, Thailand. So I always wondered like, why do people do things differently um, in different parts of the world? Why do people care about certain aspects of community or, or, or society? Or um, why do people or governments make decisions uh, in such different ways? And that led me to, it was mostly a curiosity about the environment and um, how, how uh, engaged um, regular citizens were um, in, in caring about their environment. So led to an undergraduate uh, degree in environmental science and I sort of majored in community development um, there and, uh, sorry, minored in community development while I majored in natural resources management. So it was kind of the opposite streams where I was starting to uh, think more about urban issues um, as well as rural issues because I studied in Guelph, Ontario. So I went straight from Bangkok to Guelph. <laughs> it was a trip. Um, and and um, and then I, I, I graduated and then, you know, at that time, um, sustainability was definitely uh, more of a buzzword than it is now if it was really peaking. <laughs> so I thought I was gonna stay in a career in environment, but then one of my um, fellow um, classmates um, after we graduated told me that she was gonna pursue a master's degree in community and regional planning. And I was like, what? What's that? Tell me more. What is this? And then the more she described what it was, the more I realized that's what I'd been looking for. Like it wasn't um, community rural planning as as the Guelph's focus was, and and it was very international development and rural um, community development. But there was more of an urban um, and regional. Uh, uh, lens to it. So I came to UBC uh, School of Community and Regional Planning to do that. Um, and there I, I naturally thought, oh, I'll go into the environment stream because that's my background. But then uh, the first week I was there and I learned more about kind of some of the other uh, disciplines of planning. I realized, you know what, I've spent four years uh, thinking about resource management and I'm passionate about it and but I'm not going to stretch myself that much more in a master's degree in the exact same thing. So I, I did kind of like what you did, something unnatural to me that stretched me <laughs> technically. So I went into urban design. So uh, I had never even, again, knew urban design was a field that people studied. I didn't realize what, what fascinated me about it was um, I felt like I had been walking around cities kind of blind and ignorant and unaware to why I enjoy certain spaces or why I felt comfortable or why I disliked certain spaces and that there were actually built um, 
elements that were purposely or unintentionally uh, created to, to affect the human experience and to affect the way uh, we interact with one another. So that's why I chose urban design and wanted to understand it better and, and understand how, you know, to do you bring sustainability and environment into the built environment um, as well. And, and, and um, so that was uh, fascinating and, and hard because <laughs> um, you have to draft and draw and that's not me, um, but I s struggled through it. <laughs> Um, and then at that time, I graduated. I um, did an internship with TransLink. Um, so started to uh, uh, go on a path on land use and transportation planning, and then started to understand better that those two things are married and that you can't really do one without the other because the way you plan transportation routes and networks is dependent on where you put things, where you put amenities, where you place housing, where you where the jobs are. So they're really integrated. Um, and then ended up with uh, a career in consulting in the private sector. So I made the decision to not go into public sector planning um, out of grad school because one of my mentors, um, who was a city planner at that time, had said to me, graduate, go do private sector work, learn project management. The cities will always be there. You can come back at any time. But cities don't know how to project manage very well. So <laughs> go learn those hard skills. And um, so I spent um, the better part of a decade um, in various uh, consultancies. Uh, I just happened to work for really large engineering firms that were multidisciplinary. So um, did that in Vancouver, then did that in London, UK. Um, so I ended up working a lot on master plans, um, community plans, so various scales, citywide plans. Um, so they're really high level strategic land use planning and strategic transportation planning work. So yeah, like traditional planning. Um, but also most of the time are my clients were municipalities. Um, or when in London, you, clients were really rich Middle Eastern <laughs> landowners who had vast of land that you couldn't plan enough for just because it was so vast. Um, so that was, yeah, really interesting to do that. Um, and then uh, I was in London and we wanted to come back to Canada, to Vancouver. So um, when I came back, I was still on maternity leave and didn't work right away. And then felt like it was the right sh time to shift um, into to try to get a government job. So I ended up at um, the city of Coquitlam for about a year, uh, just over a year, and was able to bring you know, my experience in um, sustainable transportation and land use planning, which is what some people call transit-oriented development planning. So how to plan um, more dense mixed-use communities around rapid transit hubs. Um, so Coquitlam at that time, the Evergreen Line was kind of brand new and, and the city was embarking on updating their area planning process to, to better um, plan communities around the new Evergreen Line station. So they're still undertaking that work. And um, yeah, a lot of even these you know, physical planning, you still as part, being part of the political system and luckily being in Canada, and a part of more of a tr more truly democratic system, as opposed to where I grew up in Thailand, um, governments here do really uh, have the processes in place and desire to hear what people think. Um, sometimes it is lip service, and or there are struggles, and it's tokenistic. Yes, that exists everywhere, but um, it's been great great to actually uh, been in the role where you come up with the engagement process. So um, 
that where you do collect feedback or do co-plan certain elements of certain um, community planning um, projects uh, with uh, uh, with people like yourselves um, who aren't professional planners. So yeah, a, part, a big part of my job has been community engagement process design and then um, carrying that out. So um, that's that's a part of a job I really like. And then now, now in my current role, I um, am part of a policy implementation group um, at the city of Vancouver um, and our group is dedicated to the downtown east side so um, right now the, for the rest of vancouver we don't have yet uh, neighborhood dedicated groups anymore it did at one point um, so which what it means is certain neighborhoods or certain areas of the city have uh, community plans so which contains a bunch of policies about uh, land use um, what the 30-year vision for that neighborhood will be about development, about um, uh, the, the vision for transportation, the vis vision for jobs, the types of jobs, the vision for um, local amenities. So I have the privilege of how um, trying to implement these policies from the plan. So planners are great at planning and writing policy and doing visioning with community, but not always great at following through and seeing how these policies actually land on the ground. So I feel really fortunate that at this point in my career now, I'm, I'm, tr I'm in that phase of work. Um, and policy implementation varies from um, uh, reviewing development, so helping my rezoning planning colleagues uh, reviewing development applications that come in the downtown east side area to see if they do fit the vision of the neighborhood. and. Um, the implementation also means we work a lot with local community groups um, in the downtown east side who apply to us for grant programs. So they're in they're very much in a way the people that are implementing the plan's uh, vision through the projects that they undertake through their organizations. Um, and policy implementation also just means interpreting the policy for other city of Vancouver departments. Um, like engineering or um, social policy we work a lot with and like how to actually create um, uh, jobs or, or retail spaces or, or other community serving uses um, where, where it's needed. So it's really diverse and I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Thank you, dear. All of you, but um, especially in your account, it really made me think of how your work is across scales and how you have to be very adaptable to understand a community that you're working with and then contextualize it with the other needs in that area and also the opposing um, ideas um, diplomatically and creatively deal with those. That's really striking and how international you all are and how you bring that knowledge from other cities and other eras and other regions to your work. Okay, um, I would like to open it up to you now to ask um, questions from the panel. Um, we can have the most uh, knowledgeable person on that topic answer or we could have two or three of you answer depending on the question. So please uh, raise your hand and fire away. Yes. Hello? OK. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you all so much. That was super, super interesting. It's really neat to hear um, sort of all the different directions that you came from and brought you where you are. Um, I was wondering, I don't think this will be a stumper, but I was curious. You all talked a lot about um, the sort of different areas and topics that you work on and ideas that you push for. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, maybe even to just one of those, each of you, about what the actual work is like, those, the the day-to-day -day or some of the, the skills that you use in your work and what the actual on the ground work looks like. Okay. 
So I'll try to be quick to give everyone a chance to speak, but that's a, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so I think the example I'll use is um, LGBTQIA2S plus inclusion in Burnaby. So about two and a half years ago, there was a community forum organized by the Burnaby Intercultural Planning Table, which is the Burnaby iteration of what uh, you were speaking to. It's a community table that focuses on inclusion for newcomers. So there's all levels of government, nonprofits that are there. And they regularly organize education sessions for people working in those sectors and also for the general public. And the topic of this forum was on inclusion of LGBTQ newcomers, because you've got a whole bunch of layers of experience there and a lot of potential discrimination and um, outright threats to their life that they may have experienced in the country of their origin, countries of transit, and also maybe still here in Canada. And out of that, the Burnaby, there was about six community members who were there who got together and decided they wanted to really push these issues in Burnaby, and so they formed Burnaby Pride. And that was basically just a conversation <laughs> that those people had. They came to the city of Burnaby and said, we need your help. So one of the things that Burnaby Council does is it grants out social planning time to support nascent community groups to figure out themselves. So I got assigned to that group. We recruited some nonprofit community members. And on a, like a daily basis, what that looked like for, because this was in May, and they wanted to put on the first Burnaby Pride event in August as a catalyst for larger conversations around inclusion for those individuals. And so we had a ton of community meetings. And I pulled some strings internally. I'm like, okay, we need to get a road closed. We need garbage and recycling pickup. I talked to my coworkers. You convince council to give this group some money. You um, help them write grant. I help them write grant applications. All of that sort of admin assistance work, which is really needed at the community grassroots level because people may be passionate about an issue, but they're holding down a couple jobs or whatever, and they don't have the admin time to make their vision a reality. So we had the first event, all the politicians showed up. It was a municipal election year <laughs> that actually worked in our favor because everyone and their dog showed up. And so we were able to get them onto our side. Um, then in between 2018 and 2019, we had again a lot more community meetings. We set up a community advisory committee, helped them write bylaws, all that kind of thing. And so now they're a nonprofit entity that can operate independently. So my work has shifted from the community end of the world to internally trying to advocate for changes to programming and public spaces to be, or uh, public spaces too, but civic spaces to be more inclusive. So Vancouver has already done this, but Burnaby has just started on the, the process of rehabbing existing spaces for more universal and washrooms and change rooms, changing over to inclusive signage. So my role in that process is getting the, doing the research so that we can either do that work in house or get a consultant. And then once the designs and whatever are in place, then I can hand it over to the departments that implement work. That was not a short answer, I'm sorry, but that's a good example. Basically, it's a lot of meetings, research and typing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, a lot of meetings. Um, I've, I've, this is only my second, like, municipal municipality have been a part of but a lot of meetings all the time yeah. because you have to coordinate with all the different departments and some departments are so large you have to coordinate with the various silos of the departments as well so an example um, from my current job is for instance things come up all the time where we get um, issues brought to us from, from, from outside of our group. For instance, VPD, Vancouver Police Department, who um, spend a lot of time in the downtown east side because um, of various issues there, um, came to ask us whether we would consider changing our design, building design guidelines um, for buildings to not include new buildings, to not include awnings and canopies, because of um, because of gathering under uh, under them. So we have this policy to 
for weather protection for everybody in the public, right? Um, as to make the pedestrian realm a more comfortable space for people to walk through. We're in a very rainy city and climate change, uh, um, who knows how, how that's gonna shift things. Um, sometimes it could be extremely hot weather that we might be dealing with. So we have these guidelines in place for a good reason. Um, so, so sometimes the reality hits that there are other interests that do come that brings up these questions about, okay, would you consider adjusting this because we have this problem? So a lot of um, the real work is, is figuring out what the real problem really is that people bring up. So uh, that to me was, um, you know, VPD being, uh, stretched they are stretched in with their resources and time that they spend in the downtown east side they are experiencing a lot of frustration that things aren't getting better as is the public and the community members but part of my job is to okay understand what people's different needs really are and then figure out what what is the best um, strategy to deal with that? And a lot of it is internal discussion about sometimes really high level, like where are our values as an organization um, or and who has control over what and what can we do within our control? Um, how are things gonna be perceived politically? You know, sometimes it's, it's counselors and politicians who also bring up questions for staff to, to look into because they're being maybe lobbied by um, or consulting with certain community groups. So, so these kind of things happen on a day-to-day -day basis and, and that's what each day looks like. Um, I'll just use an example that probably ties a little bit of what both of you have touched on. Um, interestingly, on the, on the ride here, we were talking about the fact that when we first started, uh, well, I don't know, I never left my desk. <laughs> like, you know, I, I remember when I first got there, I was given like 10 plans and put in a room and here, read. And I'm like, oh my God, it was like literally this much. Um, and it was a lot of time, you know, doing data analysis, doing the research, doing the work that kind of informs some of the thinking. And I was like, wow, I'm kind of a people person and I'm at my desk all of the time, right? And it wasn't, wasn't happy. <laughs> I wasn't happy. And it was, and everybody said, just be patient, just wait. Because, you know, when you go to the meetings, it means you've accumulated the kind of experience and expertise that allows you to kind of definitely navigate these situations and problem solve and, and troubleshoot and unblock things where communities get blocked in trying to achieve their vision, which is some of the things they talked about. Um, one thing that I'm working on right now um, is uh, the council passed a motion um, to help the Punjabi community celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Punjabi market. Um, and so to give you an example, you know, I really realized the other day, it's like, wow, I'm really in the middle of like something moving forward where like Chinatown, they're looking at how to celebrate the intangible heritage of a commercial area. Um, and so so, you know, on the weekend, you know, my friend who went to planning school with me, uh, with me wrote a book, edited a book called Authenticity, so Authentic Cities. Um, some of my other colleagues have written chapters in that book, and so I went and read what they're having to say about how we are retaining authenticity within cities. Um, I read some other books on, you know, how to kill a city, which is talking about the growing inequity in the U.S., and I know is academically not that robust book, but, you know, the title grabbed me. And, and, and trying to read all of that, pull my knowledge from my sociology undergrad, my cultural heritage, so that when I see economic development um, retail analysis come in and say, you know what, in order to maintain the market, the area, the way it is currently, you know, it has to have a certain number of customers within a certain radius who are shopping there every day. Otherwise, you just won't get um, the market base that you need to retain this area. And, you know, I have to, I, you know, I'm the only South Asian in the room. That's not the only reason, but I think your lived experience does help you because culture is changing and evolving every day. So something you studied you know, X number of years ago, it just changes every day. So I have to, I, I sit there and I try to make arguments um, to, to help people look beyond um, the past. You know, like I think because a market study worked um, and a market study I don't think is transferable 
in all situations, right? But I don't know either. We're all, we're all working and involving on this together. That's what making change means. It's like stepping into the unknown, right? So you're taking kind of a risk because you're like, well, what if, <laughs> you know, what if people don't come and shop there every day enough to make the, the retail spaces vibrant, you know? And so, um, so you're pulling on, I think the point I was trying to make is I'm pulling on my, my undergraduate um, knowledge, I'm pulling my graduate knowledge, I'm pulling my current reading, I'm pulling on my cultural heritage. And then and because like them, all of the work I've done, you know, when the community goes to the city and says, okay, well, we want to get a permit for this, or we want to do a pop-up space, um, and it sound, it's all sexy and exciting until it gets bogged down in red tape and process and cost, and they're like, whoa, we can't do this, we don't have the capacity, and not th that they don't have the skills, they literally, you know, they have full-time jobs too, and it's like, how can you unblock that, um, talk to the city staff to make them say, here, this is how we have to help this community, um, and here's how we can do it nimbly, and then help the community, you know, see the possibilities instead of um, feeling overwhelmed, which I would feel overwhelmed if I saw some of, you know, um, the amount of uh, process that's needed in order to, you know, create environmentally sound, um, equitable outcomes that we try to do. But all of that, all of those objectives means that when you go to actually get a development permit, get a building permit, uh, overhaul something that there's lots of regulations. Again, it goes back to the the um, the technical aspect of the work, um, and so um, so yeah. So I think like them, it's it's the meetings, it's the helping where things get blocked, it's understanding retail analysis, it's understanding economic analysis, um, it's understanding um, social policy, cultural policy, um, and so when you're in meetings, it sounds like yeah, it's a lot of meetings, but that's all of what's going on as you're conversing and trying to move the community's objectives ahead. So, yeah. I, I would like to probably echo a lot of what you were talking about. I think I have this love-hate relationship of working internally. There are a lot of silos, but I do like the solutions building that happen at these meetings where we gather a lot of experts from, say, rezoning or community planning, cultural, social, we're all together, we're trying to solve a problem together. We don't know all the policies with as much expertise as they do. We can provide our own. I mean, this works in like right now, I do a lot of projects and policy um, in my group. So for example, um, there's a lot of things um, like development, we can look at, there's a social access aspect to it. There's a parks aspect. We kind of say, well, my policy is this, says this, how do we, how are we able to to meet a lot of these objectives? Like we're doing a lot of um, renewal of community centers in Vancouver right now, and there's a couple projects where we're we're at a stage where where is the location of this building in this site? Um, and people are like, well, here are the seniors. We need to have it along this arterial. It's close to the bus stop. Um, this is where we should have it. And I bring to the table, well, we we're having a childcare here. We can't have it right along the arterial. There's traffic impacts, noise, and pollution. So where do we want to have it now if you have it on this side is further away from the school and the kids have to walk all this way to do their after school program so there's a lot of that kind of conversation that i i enjoy but we have to kind of figure out how do these processes work um, and same with my policy work like right now we're looking at um, how to retain a lot of community serving spaces in community owned assets so it could be places of worship it could be npo owned sites um, and then bringing people together where okay we want to redevelop this, these types of sites, um, are we going to have any barriers, right? Because there's a lot of policy, like housing policies that are in place, um, requirements for rezoning sk district schedules. There's a lot of, um, I guess, some limitations in type of what kind of equity is involved. So we're working with real estate, we're working with housing policy, we're working with our, our, our colleagues in um, cultural services. And at the same time, we're trying to find out, like, how is it that we're able to meet all these city objectives and not kind of um, block each other? I think we're trying to say, like, maybe we need to prioritize. And it's like when there's such a municipality, um, especially in bigger urban centers, there's so many little pieces that are happening um, that you have to communicate and be on top of. And again, like with all those information that we get, that's where we get the work done. Okay, now we know all of this. We've been to the public. We've maybe gone to public, um, had surveys or we've had engagement interviews. With all of this that we know, internal data and our expertise, what can we come up with? And I, that, I like the public going part of the information gathering, working with nonprofit. And especially, I also don't mind the research stuff. I really like doing all the data crunching and finding out what the solutions are. Um, I think it's part of, um, 
I just feel like, okay, there's all this knowledge and how do we implement it so we can make these positive change and if we're able to succeed, that's um, very rewarding. Um, two things I just want to add to that is um, what you mentioned about different departments have different objectives. And so when you have a versatile background and one that also has a technical element, when another department's telling you something, you don't have to accept it at face value. Like they are trying to work towards their objectives and they're trying to further your objectives, but sometimes those can be at odds. But if you have some of the technical background and experience that you know, some people here shared, then you can challenge that or you can, um, you know, question it or you can help that other person think differently. And so that's some of the value there. Um, and I would also say, I, you know, I only spent a year in a development department, but I realized when I was there, I was like, oh, I never thought and considered development where you take the applications in and you help review the applications against the policy guidelines. I never considered that as a career. I, I'm not sure why, but I realized when I was there that that it was it, 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 what I really like. There's certain values or qualities I like in a job that I'm you know surrounded by you know really curious and smart people. That the work is challenging. That it's creative. That I can help people. And even develop like not even but development had that in spades. You know, and I was like, oh, it's exa you know it's exactly what I get out of you know for a person um, in long range planning. And so what I also say to people, uh, especially people that are interested in social change, is that um, systems exclude people, and they're systems, right? And so if you have if you're a social policy person, I would say this is the same as environment. Um, maybe don't go to the jobs that are just like the environmental section of the city of Vancouver or another department, but look at, consider a job in development or something because that's, those are where the decisions get, like decisions get made at every level of the organization. So I encourage people to take their background. So say you have a background in environmental and social justice, like maybe you should find yourself in the um, city clerk's office and city clerks is who supports council, right? And so, because if you're present when decisions are getting made and you can add a different perspective even no matter what position you're at decisions start to get made differently um, so I just would um, there's something called civicinfo.bc.ca and it is every week they send out a newsletter of jobs in all cities across the province and I really encourage you to look at those jobs look at the qualifications you're looking for um, analyze them and like think differently about the organization because somebody said that you know careers are no longer like a career ladder but it's like a career jungle gym you know and so I think um, you know <laughs> you, get, you go sideways you can go up you can go down it's not it's not linear and I think our, our career trajectory have kind of, um, you know, spoken to that. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Well, thank you. So how much time do we have left there for the question? Okay, great. Well, um, one of the things that's so clear is that all of you are saying, my job is complicated. But you're also saying, I don't mind. That's the way things get done. As you wade through with those skills of critical thinking and collaboration and bringing evidence in, bringing, bringing data in to help inform that decision making. It's so um, wonderful to imagine then how your careers unfold because all of those types of things take skills and they, you can develop those over a lifetime. More questions. Any three of those? Okay. Um, I'm just curious how susceptible your work is to a change in government. Um, so after an election, do you find sometimes that your entire portfolio is kind of being rearranged and you might have to do things that you're not necessarily comfortable with or, yeah. So I can speak a little bit to this one because in less than a year, my entire world has changed. <laughs> um, not all of my portfolios, but the amount of traction that you get in certain portfolios. So as you know, Burnaby had a long time serving mayor and he did a lot of good things for the community. Um, but after 24 years, it's been refreshing to have a, a change. And um, so not all of the councillors changed, but it's been interesting to see how just with a couple of new people, voting blocks have changed and priorities have shifted. So literally, I can tell you that things that I have worked on for nine years and got nowhere with have moved in a year. 
it's a really, it matters a ton. Um, this goes in a little bit to one of the questions that I s submitted, um, so I might answer part of that now. One of the questions I thought that might be interesting to, to talk about is, how do you wor work with the politics of your job when you're trying to serve the public good um, and also provide your professional opinion, but you're getting an order from an elected official and you believe in democracy as part of the public good. And so that can be difficult to um, balance and there's no perfect answer, but sometimes, at least in my career, I have gotten direction which I feel is wrong, like immoral wrong, not just, not illegal, but immoral. And so what do you do in that situation? Um, I, one of the benefits of being in a union, <laughs> I'll give a plug out for the unions there, is within reason, you can express your opinion. Um, so in the one particular instance I'm, I'm thinking of, I recused myself from the, that particular project. I'm like, I, I can't work on this project because I'm in union, thankfully I didn't get fired. Um, but it was not appropriate for me to work on, on that. Um, it did have career implications. I'm sure it will continue to, but that was the only way I felt I could hold on to my professional uh, and personal values. Um, but as I have become more confident in my role and have been at the city longer, I do feel like I'm able to articulate my opinions and my thoughts more um, more freely, and one of the skills that I've really worked hard to develop is the ability to speak for different audiences, if that makes sense. I didn't really fully get it before I started working in this job. So when I'm out in the community, I don't wanna go, you know, I may have to talk about bylaws, but I don't sit there and spout off a lot of bylaw numbers because you just sound like a, a robot, you know? Like I, I purposefully cultivate casualness in certain situations because you just want to be a human being to talk to people. But then when I'm in a room full of engineering, engineers, I need to speak in a different way so they can hear me. And when I'm in a room full of politicians, I need to speak in a certain way so that they can hear me. I'm not saying I've figured it out, but those kinds of skills and trying to really read people, like their body language and their um, what they're saying to you with their silences <laughs> without getting too hippie has been really important. So I went on a bit of a tangent there, but it makes a really big difference, uh, particularly I would say in smaller cities where the, the politicians are really close to the planning department. Like they're always showing up at your desk and you're like, ah, you know, <laughs> where did you come from? <laughs> so you do have to learn how to navigate that. And also because if you have you place value in the public process and transparency, a politician, even with the best of intentions, could come and give you an order, right, or a direction, but if you're the only two in the room, does that exist? It's like that, you know, does the tree fall in the forest thing? Like you need some kind of public record and there needs to be a process of that discussion. And so you also have to be able to give feedback to the politician to say, well, you can bring that up under new business at the next whatever meeting, you know, and so it's a bit of a back and forth. Yeah, what she said, all of that. Um, but again, I think back to my first week or two in planning school, and one of our professors said, planning is political. And that has stuck with me more so now that I am um, in a political environment as a, as a public servant. So it's bizarre to me that ultimately my bosses are politicians. Um, who not always have the technical expertise and the day-to-day -day working knowledge of, of, of what um, I'm doing, my colleagues are doing, or what the community is, is saying. And, and there's just so many other um, factors that go into it, right? Like uh, um, in some municipalities, uh, councillors run individually. In some municipalities, it's a a party system so that has implications as well and it it shifts sounds like for instance um, at Vancouver with the last general election and, and now um, with a shift on council um, there's less uh, uh, I guess unity or one party um, 
one party uh, impact or decision making, right? And and everybody's still brand new, and you can tell everybody is is really trying hard to to hit the ground running, and. It's, there's been an unprecedented amount of council motions in these past couple of months. And the implications, there's like dollar value implications associated with, with every time a councillor makes a motion that directs staff to go explore something and come back with recommendations, right? Staff, go do your research and come tell us um, what your recommendation is. There's hours associated <laughs> with staff time, you know, there's maybe consultants you have to quickly engage to try to get things done. So it's been, and and if, I can't remember, somebody did an analysis for the city of Vancouver, if, if all those 60 odd council motions got like passed and were undertaken, how many millions of dollars that means in, in projects, um, in work going forward. So, so yeah, like politics is is part of every day. So I think some sometimes I get discouraged. It's like, why am I working for politicians? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But um, my GM actually said, you know, we do have some influence, and it goes back to what you say, right? That's the next closest thing. So a lot of being a planner in a municipal system is really about being strategic. Maybe a bit Machiavellian, some would argue. Um, you know, it's internal politics about um, reconciling the different department objectives that are sometimes at odds, but also like how do you position your argument and your recommendation to council so that um, so that the outcome that staff want gets passed on the council floor because you believe it is in the public interest and what evidence do you put into that um, whether it's qualitative evidence from what you hear stakeholders and, and public members are saying so yeah it's fascinating yeah i wish i had listened when the professor said that planning is politics i think i blocked it out i just think about you know what's right and you know um and um so as a result again working with the diversity and inclusion i can't walk and do whether it's economic development or industrial development or whatever it may be without thinking about that lens even when at times in my career it wasn't part of the municipal agenda it wasn't a priority on the municipal agenda it was always there but not a priority so if you're depending on your position within the organization trying to move something up and to be a priority that's you know it's um challenging but we all try to do that in different ways because some of us walk into this job wanting better um, urban design for our cities better environmental focus for our cities so it doesn't matter which position you take you're going to take that passion with you into the job and you're going to consciously or unconsciously look for the opportunities to um, to forward that um, and so that can be really difficult when it's not a current priority um, because you won't have the resourcing and funding for it and there's so many priorities you're juggling at one time um, it's hard to say okay well we're going out to do this neighborhood planning process let's make it more inclusive or if you're going out and doing some other policy process let's make sure we don't um, we incorporate the environmental angle it's very very, very, very difficult to do if that is not the uh, municipal priority at the time. And so, you know, what they touched on is how much of yourself are you willing to put on the line to make that happen? So that's really hard. And, and so sometimes, you know, we call them CLM. You can do career limiting moves, <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> and so we've all done them. And I, I think looking back, I don't think we would have done them differently. Um, but you feel you have to take a stand at some time um, and you do it you know in the way the formal way that um, Rebecca did it sometimes you do it in different ways by trying to speak truth to power um, you know, every day um, but you know um, and I'm just glad you know um, some of what's happening now uh, globally locally um, about equity means that um, you know finally I feel like it's the time where the political agenda the community agenda is all aligned so finally based on all those you know trials of trying to it was like pushing a ball up a hill sometimes of trying to get uh, diversity or equity into things um, you know now the environment's totally different and I, I'm given permission to walk into rooms of power and speak truth
and, and people are willing to be uncomfortable and hear the conversations. And so now I'm in a point where, whether it's talking about immigrants and refugees, whether it's just talking about equity generally or racial equity, um, I'm constantly astounded by my life and the rooms I'm able to walk in and change. You know, that, so it's, it's uh, I guess, it makes everything that I've experienced worthwhile. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks, Nadia. Um, I, I don't have any major, I think from the last council to now, there's not such a big change in their direction. I think the city of Vancouver has pretty much been more um, progressive than many other cities. I could, uh, all, but I could talk about how it's different from me working from um, three different municipalities because the council and those different ones had very different, they're more conservative or they may have different dealings with developers. So um, having worked in these three municipalities, I really felt the working environment um, for planners. I think all planners, if you talk to them, um, they all have, like we're all you know, taught the same thing, complete communities, equity, inclusivity and all this. But when we're put into these um, workplaces where we're not supported by council, I think there is a um, I think for us ethically, like sometimes we may not, we, we're given a project um, um, and we're told, okay, this is the decision. Basically it's been made. So here you can write the report about it. And um, I've been in a situation where um, I was able to avoid it. Like I was able to write a report saying that I do not agree with it. And then I went on mat leave. And then while I was gone, someone else wrote the, the report to say, yes, we do agree with this decision. So I'm like, okay, number one, I'm glad I didn't write the report because there was already an agenda on the table. So I think, um, I mean, if I were to stay and I didn't go on mat leave, I, I don't know where I would have ended. I think it wouldn't have sat right with me. Um, but when I change other ones, I mean, other um, municipalities, you can really tell like where, where it's supported, um, where staff is able to come up. I mean, one of the things that we really believe is having like you were talking about having that evidence that you know this is what we want to do we've done all the data we've done all the collection we've done all the engagement and the points that we need this type of whatever policy right and we want to sell it to council like you have to support us you you have to direct us to prepare this strategy but at, least, at the same time sometimes when we don't have um a sort of port of council, we can, there's been chance, there's been a time when we go up and we're like, okay, based on all of this, we recommend that. And then at the council meeting, just a number comes up. Okay, what about this? And all the work that we've done, basically, like we've spent all this month doing all this work and showing you what it's like, it's very frustrating. So I've been in situations like that. Um, and like, where did this number come from? How can we rationalize this now that you this you know gave this back to us so it's interesting going back to Vancouver that's why I say it's progressive compared to other places I've worked in so I would say being there and feeling like okay if I say this we're not going to be questioned because it's a given that people believe this to be true um, it's it really gives me perspective being in the planning profession and yes it's very political having um, had those experiences um, and I think it's interesting to have been working in different municipalities and different workplaces to give you that perspective. So um, it sucks, but um, it's it, it's definitely a character building and fingering fingering out with other people how to strategize um, to make you know make it right. I think. I just wanted to add two things. Um, as much as we were talking kind of about uh, the big moves when we've made, I think um, some things that uh, people have characterized as making stealth moves is like how stealth planning. So what are the small actions you can take where you have control, even when you start off as a planning assistant or a junior planner to get to those objectives, you know? Um, and so I always think, encourage people to think about what they do have ownership over and influence over in the position they're at and quietly, um, you know, of course, with your supervisor's permission. So I, for inclusion, I'm talking about really small things. It's like, who are we hiring, you know, and, and conversations about that. I mean, it's small, but it's not small, um, and, and other things. And so another thing, um, I, a lot of people who are kind of have what I would call activist personalities, you know, they're very passionate about change, but and they want to work in government, um, and they, they worry about, you know, if government moves at the pace that they want it to move and how 
that it would feel to work within a big bureaucracy. And I say that, um, I mean, Vancouver has a different energy and, and, and is, you know, but it's still a big bureaucracy. And so I tell people, not every organization is ready for where you're at at this time. It doesn't mean they won't be ready soon or later, but they're not ready now. And so if you're in an organization or a company that isn't, and you're getting in a lot of conflict because you're pushing against company objectives or organization objectives or municipal objectives, then sometimes um, it's better for your career development and for you to move objectives ahead to find an organization that's ready for you now, depending on your level of frustration. So it's unexpected advice that um, I had nobody to give me that advice, you know? Um, and so um, that's the advice that I give people that are looking to step into it now is just remember that, that sometimes um, um, organizations will get there, but if you're not able to go at the pace that, the, that they're going at, that maybe it's just not ready for you now. And so to keep that into consideration, because um, um, where uh, municipalities are at on different issues depends on where they're located in the province kind of thing. So I just want to add that. Yeah. Thank you, all of you. Uh, really. Um makes me think of the adage that the best way to learn about social change is to try to change something. Because once you do, all of these things they're talking about is illustrated how it's a system. So there are different parts you would never even think are part of that change you wanna make that have to be consulted, they have to be incorporated, and they can try to block um, the change. and. Another thing that strikes me is in the literature about transformative learning, where we actually make fundamental shifts in our thinking about something, the best way to do that is to take a change and enter into politics with that change. And that's what this degree would allow you to do, is to understand the changes you think make perfect sense. All the evidence says this would be the best way to go. It's transformative to learn how would you actually do it in the context that um, these planners are working in. Other questions? Yes. But, but oh. Just one, before yeah. we pass the microphone to the audience here, we've got a couple of online questions. Oh, from our okay. Viewers. Some, some of the questions I think have been answered in these discussions. Uh, this question is uh, for Deer. It's from Luke Forrester. And he's asking, what patterns of homelessness have you witnessed in Vancouver? And what do you think is the most effective method of addressing this issue? Uh, so homelessness, that's a very big question. That is, um, I, I won't do it justice, so I apologize up front. Um, I, it's been, uh, um, it's a very complex issue, as, as you can imagine, and it takes a lot of um, coordination internally across the municipality. And it's like some municipalities have used to say it's not our problem. It requires federal federal and provincial support, and that is still true. So patterns of homelessness, um, I actually, this year was the first time I volunteered for the homelessness count. So I, I had a one afternoon perspective on um, patterns of homelessness and the people I spoke to. Um, and a lot, um, the pattern of homeless is one thing that hasn't changed is that there's in Vancouver and in our region anyway is that um, there is such an over representation of the indigenous population in the homeless community. So um, of the people that are homeless, um, the proportion that are uh, indigenous um, is higher than the proportion of the in indigenous population regionally. So that's a sad truth that um, the more, uh, I think, decision makers and staff and community members realize some of these aspects of homelessness, I think the more we can together, you know, be in these discussions towards um, making, uh, towards solutions of, wh of what, of why is that? Why is one racial group um, more disadvantaged than others? Um, so, yeah, these are questions of reconciliation and understanding what redress really means from, from base, a basic human needs level um, and understanding how 
trauma and re-traumatizing um, cities can be and systems that city support can be for certain groups of people. So, um, and I think, you know, the question probably is, a lot of you have um, probably read the news about Oppenheimer Park um, this summer, and it appears that things are worse than ever before. And, you know, that's what the media is saying. That's what a lot of people ask me is like, why is it, why does it feel more awful than it's always been? Um, part of that is, is the opioid crisis and, you know, let five to eight years ago when things really started to um, hit the ground in the community and probably set some of the improvements or had whatever little headway we were making as a community, um, that is really changing things. So um, I, I don't have a straightforward answer, unfortunately, for Luke. <laughs> um, but um, what, can I, what can I leave um, saying? Um, patterns of homelessness. It's interesting because I work in the downtown east side. We talk about, and our plan also talks about, um, outside of the downtown east side. So we have housing targets that, that we hope to get built within the downtown east side, but we also recognize people in the community sometimes want to move out of the downtown east side because it is re-traumatizing for people struggling with mental health or addictions um, to still be in that area where they are surrounded by, by drugs, by others who are also still struggling, right? But chicken and egg, like where are the social services? So because the issues are concentrated there, the province, the municipality, NGOs um, concentrate ser social services also in the downtown east side to reach more people. But um, I think if we want to change patterns of homelessness, we also have to think um, citywide because it may not be visible citywide, but the, I think the solution is citywide. And the more complete neighborhoods we can create with, with services for everybody um, that, that can be easily accessed, I, th I think that's where part of um, the solution will be. Okay, we have a gentleman up here. Um, yes, um, thanks uh, for the info you shared with, uh, with the audience here. My question is uh, specific to those um, that are actively looking for a job in the planning uh, community in, in different cities, um, uh, especially those that are really active right now in the job hunting process and how to get the job. Um, and I just want to share an example and then take your um, opinion on that. Um, as a recent graduate from the urban geography uh, with an urban geography background on the climate change adaptation mitigation uh, background, um, I have been looking for a job, and maybe this, is, this relates to uh, some other students here as well, um, like for six or seven months. Um, and it's, it's really hard yeah. to get your first job uh, as a planner or even uh, in the cities and municipalities. And uh, I tried to shift my effort from um, applying online to do more networking right now, because after talking to uh, planners from the city of Vancouver and also some of my contacts in the city of Coquitlam and also BC High Road. The general idea they had was, uh, it, it is a little bit sad fact, but they told me that you need to get the job before it's posted. So that has a really, really tough kind of like implication and impression, puts on students, especially recent graduates. And um, so yeah, it, it seems that most of the uh, jobs at the municipalities and the crown corporations or uh, public services are being circulated internally. So, and it, it's make, it's, that makes it hard for, for students to get into that market. So I uh, want to have your opinion on that. Sorry, can I start? Um, I empathize. I have, um, you know, when I graduated from my undergrad, I was on a student permit, so there was a whole this other immigration layer on top of it, and I couldn't get a job. You can't get a job if you don't have a permit. Um, you can't get a permit if you don't have a job. <laughs> so I left, um, and I came back. Um, I think I, one, the reality is we're in a small part of the world with a very limited economy. So 
to I am so grateful every day that I have a full time job in Vancouver, not the not the city of Vancouver as a corporation. Yes, I am grateful, but just in this region. It's hard to get work here that uh, pays well, that's full time, um, that's aligned with your interests. So the struggle is very real and what you're experiencing is normal, sadly. Um, one of the ways around that is to move. <laughs> <laughs> for every, for my my partner is in a different industry, but he, um, for instance, like for every job posted, he's in tech. For every job that's posted here, there's 30 or more for the same job in Toronto. So consider other cities. Consider small places where you would never really want to live forever, but. Um, but you can get amazing career experience there because um, you'll get the breadth of experience um, in small town, maybe on an island or, or in interior BC. I know uh, those are big decisions, but in, Van but in the region, um, other than what you're doing, I think you know networking is for some people are comfortable with that if you are keep at it. Um, you can volunteer with uh, professional organizations. Planning has a planning institute, um, so a Canadian planning institute, and then the, each province has its own chapter, so the, the PIBC is the one in BC. So, you know, other ways, that's another way of networking. Um, it is hard to, to know when a, you're looking at a job posting whether there's an internal candidate um, kind of official, unofficially um, earmarked for that position. So if you, one way to capitalize on your network, um, when, I, when I was applying for my job at the city of Coquitlam, at that time, uh, a, a grad school friend was working there um, and um, in an acting kind of manager, senior planner uh, role. So I asked him out front, like, is are there internal candidates competing for this position? Um, if so, how many? So, you know, I couldn't ask him maybe to say like, hey, is this somebody else's job? For like, But I could ask, do you expect a lot of internal candidates to apply? And I think that's a fair question to ask. So if the answer is me now thinking as, if somebody asked me that, I, I would be comfortable saying, yes, I will expect a lot of internal competition. Or actually, this is a reposting there hasn't been an internal candidate appropriate to fill this job yet. So, um, and also consider other um, jobs that aren't traditional planning jobs, right? But that, but that will get you involved in a lot of the things we've spoken about and that will teach you how to think critically, how to bring together different groups of people um, that will get you to work in across different sectors um, of industries or you know pick a maybe a focus um, within community building of some sort like go into local economic planning or go into um, yeah a, a the social um, planning work so there are options um, I think what I've learned in my 10-year career is that like, yeah, it'd be great to land that like um, dream job right away, but it's okay if you don't. And just keep amassing the life experiences and every and whatever job you do end up in, just like Nadia said, just bring that to whatever you're doing day to day and that's valuable. Your lived experience, no matter what, is valuable. Um, and I mentor a lot of people, immigrants, non-immigrants, um, and, um, I think by networking, it's really important um, because what they're telling you is the types of experience or skills or courses that you can need to just give you that little bit, position yourself well. Um, I'll give you an example. So I was mentoring someone who um, was from another country but had gone to graduate school here and uh, couldn't find a job. And I had all my great suggestions because, you know, it's like, go to Vancouver Island, you know, just walk into planning departments, like ask for information interviews, you know, like take some risks. Um, maybe go on LinkedIn and see if they'll meet with you first and then meet, go to Vancouver Island. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is just go to different places. Go, if you're in Ontario, go outside of Toronto, go to smaller communities, like literally go there. What does it feel like? Walk around 
and then you know ask for information interviews. I actually know an immigrant who was counseled to do that by her um, count employment counselor and walked into Metro Vancouver and asked for that. And as public servants, I mean, Vancouver, we have a different load. So I couldn't even get information interviews in Vancouver, even though I use all my personal networks at that time. Um, but she went to Metro Vancouver and um, just asked for an information interview and somebody willingly met with her and became a mentor um, and got and she was actually thinking she was actually an engineer planner from Hong Kong and she was thinking of switching careers to nursing but the, the employment counselor said don't keep trying with this and you know she's had a great career like she's um, that's an, an, another story but um, so I really recommend continuing with that um, the person I gave the advice to he was more introverted so I knew he was like oh, not happening <laughs> I'm not gonna take a bus and just you know go and talk to uh, cities that I don't know anybody. Um, and so a year later, I got a reference call for him. And I was like, wow, you're still unemployed after a year? Like, and you never called me at Harvard to help? Anyway, so I connected him with a professor who was looking for someone to do research. I can't remember if he did the research for free or how he did it. But that, that professor, he had some work to show for it. And he also had a reference from her. And she's excellent at writing references, like so powerful and so passionate. So because he didn't have as many Canadian work references, right? And so he he had me and he had that person and that really helped him you know get the job he was also thinking these are such small things but he was thinking of leaving for the summer going back home and I said um, and it was June and I said do not leave in June because the hiring ends at the end of June and there'll be nothing in the summer right and he stayed and he actually got his interview in June right and he said I'm willing to go anywhere in the country I'm really open Canada something I want to explore he ended up up north and um, yes he was unemployed for a year after graduating he ended up up north and he's he was an earning he was like 40% more than his colleagues and he actually jumped a position right um, so you just um, and I have another example of an immigrant that I was mentoring tried to get into the city had um, basically double qualifications that anybody would apply for for an entry-level job because she came from somewhere else and then couldn't get a job and said okay i'm going to get canadian education and she you know people are like you're too overqualified anyways there's that's a whole other thing um and then um but i said to her i said you know somebody's going to be able to read your resume and understand your work experience because she was an architect and a planner they're going to be able to read your work experience read your education understand what it's going to bring to them sure enough her hiring manager was an architect planner skipped over uh, several levels um, and became a planner too, like her first job, right? So it is really disheartening. And I mean, maybe those examples I've been giving you are people that are further ahead kind of um, in their, you know, have more years of experience or have done more degrees. But what I, I think some qualities from those stories are kind of a willingness to go anywhere to try things to start from, you know, she went further out outside of Vancouver um, than she had expected to or wanted to and then moved back in. Um, sometimes like the fellow that's up north he's happy like I check with in with him every year and he's he's like not wanting to move back you know um, so there's a lot of unexpected things that you'll find that you'll maybe even be able to move faster um, by moving into small communities uh, um, and then you'll be able to actually some people move back because they can then move back into management into large organizations so they move up very quickly in smaller organizations where in larger organizations it's very hard to do so some things that seem a, a disadvantage and a frustration if you take risks or you know try things in a different way um, the outcomes can be better for you um, and sometimes in smaller communities we're hearing that um, um, immigrants are actually doing better in smaller communities so what's happening is some smaller communities that are progressive are then looking for staff that are of those diverse communities right whereas they may not have been doing that before or sometimes they don't even have the time to build the networks to diverse communities and diverse professionals so if you present yourself they're like oh yeah you know we were, we we're wanting to do more of this we just didn't know how to attract more diverse professionals to our communities and it doesn't even have to be that far like the island and imo you know different things like that so i think uh, but planning has always been competitive um, you know and um, when I started there was 200 resumes for every job that was posted and I still get 200 resumes for jobs so um, and most of them are qualified right so um, there was a time there where I also was getting resumes where I would see two undergraduates and a master's and I was like oh what's this about and they would say oh the first master's was for the first undergrad was for our parents the second undergrad is what we wanted to do and then we got our master's but um, yeah so there's all that but um, so uh, yeah so I guess there's different lessons in there um, yeah 
I'll just really quickly add a couple of things. So from my personal experience, I was very stubborn and wanted to enter at a particular type of role. I wanted to be a social planner. I didn't want to be a development planner. So I went to the nonprofit world first. I got paid a lot less, um, but it gave me that experience that you needed. I needed to apply for the job. And so it took a couple of years, but it did give me the ability. And then I just felt better sort of emotionally and mentally, like I'm working and you know, at least I can feed myself and all that good stuff. Um, some of my other coworkers went the different route where they got a municipal job so that unrelated to planning, like in recreation or something, which was still interesting, but and still relatively well paid because of the union pay grade uh, scale. Uh, and then they're the inside candidate and they can internally network. So I'm just putting it out there that those are two uh, different options. Um, and then also I concur moving outside of the region if that's uh, reasonable for you. I know a lot of my uh, schoolmates uh, worked in the prairies for a while. Some stayed because they loved it, some moved back here. But these are communities that don't have the same tight uh, job market. And then the last thing is, um, I know doing a master's degree is difficult for many people for a lot of reasons, but it did open the doors, at least for me. I had calls and returns that I didn't get when I was an undergrad. So just a thought for um, perhaps later on in life when that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, I just want to just iterate, I mean, that was my experience, right? I couldn't find work in Ontario and I was open to, to move to Saskatchewan and I worked in um, Regina, not in my preferred, I wanted to do policy and I ended up doing um, land use, which um, stretched me because I'm not a really detailed oriented type of mind, but um, it really gave me the foundation. So, I mean, the first few years you may not be doing what you want to do, but ultimately um, it's able to o open doors for you because you have that experience and now I'm doing more policy which is um, and community engagement which I enjoy. Um, I also another thing that um, Nadia uh, reminded me is that um, not only are people um, may find it difficult finding a career in planning but there might be some um, difficulty for people to get into planning school and I know um, for me um, I had done my undergrad and I was I just wanted to finish my undergrad at the time I'm just like yeah okay well you know I'm I'm doing okay I'm people were saying like oh I have, I have to do my honors and I'm like I'm not gonna do grad school like I don't need to worry about that right um, and after I worked in um, nonprofit for a few years and I heard about planning wanted to apply um, crap like my grades weren't good enough I didn't have the honors I'm like how am I gonna get into grad school and when I first applied I wasn't getting into grad school the first round um, and so I was like maybe it has to do with my academics so what I decided to do while I was still working um, was uh, to take a course I took a course um, in communications that was related and I did all my projects that were related to planning type of things I volunteered for the professor I talked to her I got to know her ideas of where I wanted to go um, and at the end of it she I had um, quite good grades she was able to write me a, a, a glowing recommendation letter um, and the next round when I applied for planning school I was accepted into a few programs so that was something that I did I did hear from other people who I've worked with um, who also were not getting quite the good grades and they didn't know about this one course kind of, um, cause it was more, for me, like I hadn't gone to school for a few years. So when I went back, it was like, okay, um, my most recent academic foray, I'm able to prove that I'm able to do well. Um, so my other colleague who um, found a hard to get into plan school the first time, she redid her whole undergrad program, which was four years. So instead of going back four years, you can try one or two classes is what I would recommend. And maybe other volunteer work that is, um, quite aligned with where you want to go in your um, in your planning studies. Okay, I believe you. I had a question, but you kind of answered it through that, so. Other questions? Thanks. Um, hi, so I want to apologize in advance because I feel like pl planners probably get a lot of flack for this question, um, but what sort of tools do you have at your availability to address affordability issues, particularly in Vancouver? Yeah, depending on our time, we can all take a crack at that. It's, it's hard to be really frank. Um, we live and work in a market-based economy, and so even with extra tools that are given to cities, like the recent rental zoning capability, um, it's really hard. So in Burnaby, we now have a progressive council, and they've passed really um, 
quite remarkable um, rental like rental retention policies and tenant assistant policies for when land does redevelop. Um, but there's limited ability without injections of cash from higher levels of government. And this is why you keep hearing that refrain again and again. And it sounds like whining and sometimes it is and sometimes it's just very real because the construction costs are here and then you need to operate the, the housing. And so how do you fill the the gap in that cost without a direct subsidy from um, other levels of government while re maintaining a market-based system. Um, so cities have some controls and powers, um, but perhaps not as many as the general public believe. Um, and we're very dependent upon money flows. Uh, however, and then, the, sorry, what I should add before I move on is, um, a refrain that you'll often hear from the development community is that all of the regulations and controls that cities try to put in, like environmental standards for building design or urban design standards, they're costly and they take time, right? And some of that is real and some of that is, is not. It's bluster to try to move forward with a project more quickly so that they can make a larger profit, again, in a market-based economy. You'll see where I'm going with this. Revolution. Rebuild the world. <laughs> um, but there is a balance there because you want, you know, an environmentally efficient building, but you also need something that can be built, if it's affordable housing, fast, right? Um, so I haven't really answered your question other than to say it's hard. Um, there, are some, there, are some, there are some things that cities can do and cities shouldn't be off the hook for their role in the affordability but we're dependent upon money from higher levels of government, I guess is the bottom line. So Mike. Yeah, the uh, tool most cities use is zoning. Um, and when you're talking about housing, um, inclusionary zoning, meaning there's a specific requirement where um, if you want to build in this area and you want to build housing, an X proportion has to be social housing. So that's the inclusionary bit. So um, some, sometimes cities will, will uh, have that, that in um, their bylaws. So for the downtown east side, um, we have um, a requirement where you'll incentivize extra density for developers um, for a trade-off in them providing social housing. So um, the minimum requirement across most neighborhoods of the downtown east side is 20% uh, social housing, and we have specific definitions of what that means at what uh, rates of income levels that housing has to be provided at, and the developers um, can't own and operate that. It has to be turned over either to the city. Um, so they build, we own, and, or, or um, and then we get a nonprofit to run. So the city and the developers usually don't run the social housing. Um, we get nonprofits to do that. So inclusionary zoning is probably the biggest tool. And otherwise, it's you know carrots where where other parts of the city it's it's yeah it's an incentive. You can it's not a force, but you can get more goodies, more height, more density if you give us. Um, other amenities and sometimes the amenity is social housing so but I would say um, it's not just housing affordability that we're talking about it's you know affordability for retail spaces businesses are really struggling as well and I don't think cities have found a good way because we don't have a lot of control over taxation and tax subsidies um, again that goes back to provincial regulations as well um, so I think yeah until cities can find a way to subsidize um, city-owned spaces um, so that local small social enterprises or businesses can stay in those neighborhoods, um, then, then you're going to see what, what, what we've been seeing. I'll be really quick. Um, I know we're talking about affordability crisis. I think I'll just uh, 
was going to add to um, Deer's point. It's not just affordability for housing. It's affordability, like you said, for local retail, um, a lot of nonprofit spaces, childcare. Like there's a affordability crisis for all types of things. When we live in, a, we need all these things to to survive. And I think all of these spaces we we are struggling with. And again, um, an, an ideal world where there is enough capital and, and operations. Um, the government will take over like the social housing, the childcare, um, the seniors and nonprofit spaces on all of that. Um, so we are using the carrots and, and incentive, um, uh, the sticks <laughs> for now, but um, we will see. I mean, it'll, it, I think it has to be like a multi-government level um, and conversation with, with the stakeholders to get the support that we need in our cities. This might have to be the last question. One more. <laughs> well, since I'm the course instructor, I get a chance to. Um, I just actually want to thank you all very, very much for being here today, for sharing all of your expertise, uh, your role, your ideas, your visions. And I think that one thing that I wanted to kind of round out everything is how much all of you, um, how strong ethics is such a you know big part of what you do, um, how you want to contribute to the public good. So if one of you can have a one sentence kind of advice, <laughs> one sentence kind of advice to, um, well, my planning students, but also uh, the other uh, special guests that we have here today, what would it be, even if they don't end up going into planning school, but how can they contribute to creating more sustainable, socially just um, cities and neighborhoods? One sentence. Um, it's all about people skills. Change happens with your relationships with people. So whatever degree, career you go into, really focus on how you relate to other human beings and affect their thinking. So the thing you'll learn is planners can't do it in just one sentence. Uh, I, get, yeah. <laughs> I get asked to write a memo and I produce like a 25 page report. But anyways, um, my thought is be aware and engaged. We're all busy, we're all tired, but Th be aware and pay attention to the processes happening at the political level around you at all levels and take part in those. You know, go to the public open house that's for the building down your street. Go to the special event at the rec center. You know, take advantage of the resources in your community and also participate in them and give your feedback when it's asked for. Um. I think I go back to how uh, systems um, exclude people. So I would say if you're in high school um, or in university is really pay attention to the technical aspects of the work while balancing um, your interest in the community. And so just trying to balance both. Um, but um, I think for some of us in the arts, um, we, we kind of look at the broad arcs of change and so really also be able to, to get into uh, the details. I guess I would like I would say um, speak up for what you feel is right. Also speak up be, um, on behalf of those that don't have the voices to speak up. So I, I think it speaks to some of the inclusivity that and diversity we talk about. Um, get everyone on the table, um, and you know if you hold the whole thing about trying something if it doesn't work, you know try try again and and work as a team. Collaboration is really important as well. Thank you. Wonderful advice. So thank you, Rebecca and Jir and Nadia and Ada. I thought it was most excellent. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, high school students, for listening. Come join us at SFU. And, <laughs> and have a great day. <laughs>